So we now proceed to the programme, and we start with the lecture associated with the RES G Group Award. This went to the Superdarn Consortium, and the talk will be presented by Professor Mark Lester, and the title is The Super Dual Auroral, Auroral Radar Network, New Insight, Insights into Earth's Space Environment. Mark. Okay, well, thank you, John, and uh, uh, thank you for uh, coming to this uh, presentation. Um, I'd uh, like to make the point that this is uh, uh, that the Superdarm team is a, a wide and diverse uh, community, uh, and uh, it's uh, the efforts of the whole team that uh, uh, should be applauded here and I'm just representing that, uh, that team today. So uh, just to give you some background to what I'm going to be talking about, primarily I'm going to focus on uh, ionospheric physics, although there is some background to that, as well as some introduction to the Superdarn uh, technique. Uh, and I'll also talk then about three uh, areas of science. These are uh, relatively uh, uh, personal areas of science as far as uh, uh, some of the uh, so, um, activities that we've been involved in and does, does not represent fully the breadth of work that we have uh, we've done in the community. Uh, so uh, we'll start with the magnetosphere and uh, fundamentally... Um, the uh, magnetosphere is that this uh, a region of space that surrounds the Earth. Uh, <coughs> it's a, a very dynamic system. Uh, it contains a whole host of different plasma regimes, and uh, each of which are threaded by uh, the Earth's magnetic field, extending from one pole to the other in in some cases, but also extending from uh, one of the uh, regions in the northern, uh, northern or southern polar regions and connecting to the interplanetary magnetic field into uh, space. And I'll come back to that later. These uh, plasma regions are determined primarily by their particle uh, densities and energies, and uh, this picture does not do any justice to the dynamics of this system, which can be uh, very rapid and very intense. The main controlling feature of this is, in fact, uh, the uh, solar wind, uh, the influence of the, the interaction between the uh, super alphanic solar wind uh, passing past the magnetic field, creating a, initially a bow shock and then interacting directly with the uh, plasmas of the magnetosphere through, uh, primarily through magnetic reconnection. And in the tail, uh, reconnection processes also add to this, uh, to this process of, uh, of uh, dynamics. And that's an important part of this uh, presentation because it's one of the things that uh, the Superdarn uh, network has been able to demonstrate very, uh, very well. And a key point to remember is, is that the inner boundary of this system is in fact the uh, field lines which, uh, the ends of the field lines, actually in the ionosphere, in the conducting upper atmosphere. So this is a, a well-established picture of, uh, of Earth's ionosphere. Uh, there is a lot of variability. It's controlled by, uh, one can consider it as effectively a balance between production, primarily through photoionization, but also some uh, particle precipitation, uh, losses, uh, which are primarily recombination or attachment, and transport. And transport is important. In, uh, for some of the layers, uh, whereas it's less important for others. In particular, the F layer, the, uh, the F region, the region where you have the peak densities, transport is actually incredibly important because it's that that maintains the F layer after 
photoionization has been switched off. The D and E layers are less controlled by, uh, by this, uh, this um, transport. So to give you some idea about the fact that the ionosphere is different depending on where you're sitting on the ground, if we're thinking about the upper atmosphere in the uh, polar regions, then the critical things here are to mention are the fact that uh, the field line directly connects to the solar wind. That's important because that adds another layer of potential uh, uh, plasma source. It is controlled in terms of transport. The convection processes, the processes related to the magnetic reconnection, are the critical aspects that, that control this. Uh, and uh, in uh, uh, terms of um, asymmetries between the northern and the southern hemisphere, there is often considerable asymmetry in terms of the behavior of these two uh, polar regions. And this depends on a range of parameters, uh, such as the orientation of the interplanetary magnetic field, the offset of the dipole, uh, and the conductivity, sigma. In the auroral latitudes, uh, that's where you see this ring of, uh, of aurora, typically. Uh, again, you can have both open and closed field lines in this region. Convection is still the dominating transport mechanism, and there are still asymmetries, but the particle precipitation here is typically much higher energies that you see in this region than typically in the polar cap. And then finally, at mid-latitudes, uh, you have a very different scenario. Typically, the field lines are closed, so in other words, they directly link to the opposite hemisphere. Uh, corrotation and new, neutral winds are the dominant transport processes. Uh, you do have additional plasma sources, but mostly these are from uh, uh, only during really severe, significant events. And generally, you would not expect significant interhemispheric asymmetry, although uh, the conductivity may be somewhat different in the winter and summer. But what you do know, know is that there are regional effects, and one of the key regional effects here is the South Atlantic anomaly. So why would I introduce this topic in this way? Well, the key region is, is that Superdarn actually has radars which measure in the polar cap. These are the, uh, the green fields of view. In the auroral regions, or the high-latitude regions, the blue fields of view, and in the mid-latitudes, the red fields of view. And you can see from these two maps that you have radars in, uh, in both hemispheres. In the northern hemisphere, we currently have uh, 22 operational radars, and in the southern hemisphere, currently, there are 14. The radars uh, receive backscatter or receive returns, uh, signal returns from a variety of sources, uh, particularly, uh, we see them from ionospheric irregularities, from the ground or the sea, from meteor trails, and from other features such as polar mesosphere summer echoes, and indeed things like uh, the International Space Station. Um, this scatter typically is field aligned in terms of the ionospheric, that's magnetic field aligned, and is effectively very similar to the, the Bragg scattering of X-rays from crystals, but uh, I won't go into that detail. And the scale size of these irregularities, given that these radars operate at 8 to 20 megahertz, is actually very large. They're an order of 15 meters. This just shows you the uh, contribution to Superdarn. As I said earlier, there's a big team. There are 10 uh, different uh, countries which operate these radars, plus uh, several others with whom uh, we have collaborative agreements. But you can see that the main contributors are the Americans, the Canadians, uh, and the Brits, as well as, uh, in the Southern Hemisphere, our Australian and Japanese colleagues. <coughs> so the technique relies entirely on OTH, over-the-horizon propagation. Uh, 
the radars uh, scatter from uh, irreg field aligned irregularities uh, either in the E region or indeed in the F region. Because this is over the horizon, you get scatter from uh, the ground back along these different paths. And you can also get one and a half hop or indeed two and a half hop uh, propagation to the ionosphere uh, as well. And we did indeed use scatter from all of these different modes uh, in our analysis. One of the problems, however, is that as you go to further and further ranges, uh, the, uh, the effect of the ionosphere starts to uh, increase in terms of uh, being able to determine exactly where uh, the scatter is coming from, and that's an active piece of work that we're dealing with. Now, as I said, these, uh, we measure the line of sight velocities, uh, and the line of sight velocities that we measure are simply that, their line of sight. They don't tell us about the two-dimensional velocities directly. What we can get, however, is we can use the data in order, in a, in a multi-parameter fit, uh, to uh, the electrostatic potential, such that we, provide, we find an electrostatic potential which best fits the line of sight velocity observations. Uh, this is an example of data from the 17th of March 2015. This is uh, uh, also known as uh, St. Patrick's Day storm. In fact, there were two St. Patrick's Day storms on consecutive years, uh, 2014 and 2015. Uh, and uh, this illustrates how you can derive the full, uh, almost, almost full global electrostatic potential from your set of observations. Where there are limited data points, such as in this region in here, for example, you have to fill in with uh, a less uh, dense network of, um, uh, of uh, model data points. Now, this, is, this approach provides a global fit rather than a, a small or mesoscale uh, structure, although you can see mesoscale structure in here, which is controlled by specific uh, uh, observations of, uh, of the velocities. Whether this is actually directly real or not is, is perhaps uh, something that would need to be investigated. But this snapshot of uh, the global convection pattern is taken... Uh, in a, a two-minute uh, window. And we can continue to produce these two-minute uh, global snapshots, or indeed down to one minute, on a, base, on a regular and continuous uh, basis. Now, one of the first studies that was done was to look at uh, something called poleward moving radar auroral forms. These are uh, features where you have scatter, which appears at one location and then gradually moves poleward. These have been related to uh, auroral signatures in the polar cap, which seem to be being stripped from the main auroral oval. Here's the remnant of one. In this case, you've got one forming here, and in this uh, snapshot from, uh, of the aurora from space, you can see this feature has moved down here. And indeed, when you overlay uh, the radar scatter from this. You can see here's radar scatter associated with this uh, remnant. Here's the velocity, uh, here's the scatter being uh, formed here and moving into the polar cap. The color coding here is on the line of sight velocity. And the key point to take away from this is, is that the line of sight velocity in these regions, these newly created regions of of open magnetic flux, if you like, uh, is moving with velocities in excess of a kilometer per second. And this is illustrated, the, the way in which this is done is illustrated in this picture, where you have uh, newly created magnetic, uh, open flux on the boundary between open and closed magnetic flux being formed here, and then gradually being uh, um, taken into the polar cap and extended down on the, uh, uh, on this case, on the dawn side, on the dusk side. And so in looking at the magnetopause boundary, what you would see is the region forming here, 
and then gradually uh, moving off uh, down towards the dusk boundary uh, and retaining the, uh, the structure as this uh, reconnection site uh, continues to uh, get uh, um, opened or continues to uh, be active. Now, the point that I made earlier on about magnetotail dynamics is that in addition to reconnection at the day side, you have reconnection happening in the night side. And this has allowed a number of people to think about this in terms of adding and subtracting flux to the polar cap, rather like you would be blowing up a, a balloon and letting it deflate. Uh, and this has become known as the expanding contracting polar cap paradigm. Uh, and it illustrates very well how things vary as a function of time. Uh, here are two papers, uh, one by uh, uh, images, one by Cisco and Huang, who only considered the dayside reconnection site, and one by Lockwood and Cowley, who considered both dayside and nightside. But there are other people who were working on this around the same time, such as Freeman and Southwood. And if we look at this movie uh, now, uh, and I'll ask if this can be played. Um, the, the movie will show you how you create flux on the day side, where you, you start to uh, open the, uh, the flux. Yeah, can you play the movie, please? Thank you. Uh, where the flux will open at this location here. You'll add flux. You create these potential patterns in here. Uh, and then you'll switch on night side reconnection, and that will uh, start to change the balance of the processes here. So now you have uh, competing uh, day side and night side reconnection. They're about equal at the moment, so everything's around the same. Now the night side reconnection rate increases, so this starts to contract. Uh, and as the day side reconnection switches off, uh, this contraction starts to increase and gets more rapid. And that uh, was, is simply based on the paradigm, and Superdan was critical in actually de demonstrating that as you do this, the changes in all of this give you the potential pattern uh, values, and these potential uh, changes are in fact exactly in agreement with the potentials measured by Superdarn themselves, uh, by the Superdarn radars. The substorms, uh, often uh, we have been uh, parameterizing uh, convection uh, by the uh, orientation of the interplanetary magnetic field. But because of this re uh, observation of, with the substorm activity, the night side reconnection, you realize that actually you have to parameterize things by IMF and substorm sub onset local time. And this is some recent work by Adrian Grocott at the University of Lancaster, which actually demonstrates the difference between this type of pattern where you're only parameterizing by the day side and this type of pattern where you parameterize both by both day side and night side uh, reconnection rates. I'll skip that particular figure. Now, one of the things that you can look at now is actually where does the plasma go in the polar cap? And this is actually very important if you're trying to understand the structuring in the polar cap. And this is just an example where we have identified two particular periods of ex, uh, enhanced plasma density over Svalbard. And what we can now do is use the, these uh, potential patterns to try and track both from here back, uh, uh, backwards in time as well as forwards in time and work out where these scatter regions actually occur. Now these scatter regions are where you get the enhanced backscatter uh, returns. So you start to see these things moving in the, uh, in the poleward direction in the radar over here and you can see that ultimately this, uh, this enhanced scatter, this enhanced polar cap uh, patch will actually enter a region on the night side. And this is where you start to see the scatter moving equatorward on the night side towards the radar. And the timing of this is really quite remarkable. And with, but without these observations where you can actually demonstrate not just the fact that scatter goes from here, uh, that plasma goes from here to here, 
but also the fact that these regions actually rotate often because this is highly time variable, this region, and it's actually a very complex process. Uh, and so you can't just assume that things are moving in a very steady way. And this is illustrated next in the following movie where we have total electron content measurements from a network of uh, um, receivers together with the polar cap potential patterns. And <clears throat> once the movie... Could you start mo the movie, please? Thank you. So you'll see that you'll get a tongue of ionization forming, being pulled into the polar cap. That's this ionization here, extending across here, and then depending on when you have reconnection happening, you get blobs moving in this direction and indeed in the, in the, uh, in the dusk direction. So it's actually a very complex process, which is summarized in this, uh, in this schematic. So you have reconnection happening across this site. It drags ionospheric uh, plasma from the, the daylit hemisphere, or the daylit part of this uh, region here, into the polar cap. Then these regions get extended off onto the day side across this particular uh, footprint of uh, reconnection on the night side, either into the dawn direction or into the dusk direction. And these regions are important because what they actually tell you uh, a little bit, these regions will in fact cause scintillation of signals on transonospheric uh, signal paths and can impact significantly on things like GPS and, uh, and uh, radio connections with, uh, with satellites. At mid-latitude, you get similar structuring, but this is now caused by these very enhanced flows, which are called subauroral polarization streams, in the, in the uh, subauroral region, and these are, this is where the mid-latitude radars come in. Uh, and what we're seeing here is structuring of the TEC in a different way, where you're actually losing density, because the flows are going through this region much, much more quickly, and that in leads to re enhanced recombination because you're heating uh, the plasma. And this particular study uh, published this year illustrates how these regions or where these regions occur as a function of magnetic local time and latitude for a range of different uh, magnetic activity indices. So typically, you see these at much lower latitudes when you have these very enhanced storm events associated with uh, coronal mass ejections or uh, high-speed streams from the, in the solar wind. And indeed, you see the enhancement in the velocity is much higher in this sector than, uh, than um, uh, in, in other local time sectors, but also, uh, also for the lower uh, values of magnetic activity. Finally, then, I want to talk about atmospheric waves. Uh, these are uh, atmospheric gravity waves that you're seeing here. These are uh, buoyancy waves, if you like. They're not gravitational waves, which some of my students uh, often uh, think of. Uh, uh, but basically, these can be caused by a number of processes. Typically, uh, for these medium-scale events, we've often thought that they occur, they occur as, a, as a result of auroral activity. But in fact, this, uh, this study by uh, um, PhD student in, in America actually demonstrates that a lot of these, these uh, gravity waves, and you can see that some are moving equatorward, <coughs> some of these features actually move poleward as well. But uh, his study actually demonstrated that when you actually break down this and compare either with auroral activity or the polar vo vortex variability in the stratosphere, in the uh, stratosphere, then actually what you're seeing is uh, filtering of this of this effect by uh, the str by stratospheric <laughs> winds, and this is affecting the processes which are happening at higher altitudes, typically 300 kilometers or, or more. And then finally, uh, just one other um, uh, activity which uh, we have a problem with, and that is earthquakes. Um, you can see uh, 
this is actually some, uh, some data from uh, a radar in Japan, uh, where, which was impacted by a very severe earthquake in uh, March 2011. Uh, and I can remember that day very well because I was here at the Royal Astronomical Society uh, and we were involved in running a G discussion meeting uh, and two of our colleagues were in Japan at that moment in time. One of them actually ended up uh, having to walk along a railway line um, because the Shinkansen that uh, she was on was uh, badly affected by this earthquake. Uh, but what we're seeing here is the, impact, the uh, wave activity in the upper atmosphere associated with this, uh, 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 this um, uh, earthquake where the epicenter was down here. The radar observations are up here. And of course, that's, this gives us a, a technique for actually observing effects of, um, of uh, these uh, gravity waves, uh, sorry, of these... Um, uh, earthquakes, where the earthquakes are actually triggered in the, um, uh, in the ocean regions. Now, people with solid earth backgrounds will know far more than I do about uh, this particular uh, topic, but uh, this is actually quite an interesting piece of work. And so finally, uh, I'd just like to finish by thanking the RAS for the award of the group award to Superdarn. Uh, and hopefully I've given you a taste of some of the brilliant work that uh, my colleagues have been doing over the last 20 plus years. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Mark. We have brief time for questions or comments, if there are any. Back. So when you, is this on? Okay. When you measure these changes in total electron content, and you say, are, are you are you certain that they're due to advection of plasma, or can there be transient ionisation from other sources associated with the auroral process? Well, okay. So that's a good question, Lindsay. Um, in the polar cap, uh, you can create the plasma in two ways. You can either create it by dragging it from the, the daylit uh, ionosphere, or you can get precipitation into the, uh, into the atmosphere, uh, into the upper atmosphere, which creates additional ionization. The fact that we are able to track this tongue uh, using the uh, radar observations tells us that it's actually coming from the dayside region and it's not being created, so it's being transported rather than being created in situ by particle observation, particle precipitation. Okay. So the buoyancy waves, they, they're coming from the auroral regions, they're drifting equatorward. Yeah. Presumably they're carrying energy with them. Yeah. Do you know roughly how much energy you're transporting out of that auroral polar can't region? Ask quantitative questions on a Friday afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> the short answer is I can't remember. I mean, significant amounts of energy, and of course, what they're doing these ways uh, is actually restructuring the plasma um, in a in a very uh, in a in an unusual way. Uh, they're creating. Uh, they're transporting energy from, if they're caused by a raw uh, activity, they're transporting energy into other parts of the atmosphere. Uh, and I know uh, the UCL group have done modeling of these, uh, these waves, which actually demonstrate this in, uh, and the effects of this elsewhere. <coughs> but the orographic waves, the waves where you, uh, which are smaller scale and some of the smaller MSTID waves, and also the polar vortex waves, that's a completely different kettle of fish, and we still don't really understand that. And that's partly because when atmospheric modelers do their, do their thing, basically they put a, a, a boundary of 90 kilometers, and then they just have a, a gravity wave for actualization. Okay, I'm afraid the clock has caught up with this, so Mark, thank you very much. Indeed.